Welcome back to our uh, Wednesday night adult Bible study. I'm excited about launching into this new series tonight. We're going to look at uh, the Gospels uh, and we're going to really in- kind of lay the landscape for uh, our study tonight before we actually start jumping into um, looking at the books and then looking at the, the overview of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Um, but as you know um, a little bit about me, I really enjoy uh, reading books. And one of the things I enjoy, or not so much enjoy, but one of the stressful things about reading books is that you, there's always this pressure out there to read uh, these books that people are saying, hey, you need to read this. Uh, I don't have anyone, anyone like to read, and there's always people saying, hey, you need to read this book. And they're putting these books, and your book pile list is getting higher and higher, and you're not actually quite making it to... Uh, that list. Well, that's me. So not only do people sometimes put that pressure on me, I put that pressure on myself and saying these are these types of books uh, that I need to read. And typically it's um, uh, like it's a classic or something something like that that is known to be truly great. Um, and I feel like there's this pressure for me to actually read this book uh, at some point in my life. Uh, this summer there was a book that I read it's called A Tale of Two Cities. I don't know if you've read it. It's by Charles Dickens. And it was this book that was out there that I was like, I, I just need to sit down and read this. Uh, so I, I picked it up. Uh, I'd been reading a lot of Star Wars books uh, at that time. I love Star Wars books, but they're not necessarily like high literature, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you're going to call it that. So I was like, I need to read something of substance. Um, and so I picked it up. And when I started reading, I was like, oh, my goodness, I don't have a clue what's happening. Like, I don't understand what's happening in this narrative. The language is a little bit off. There's words that are spelled differently than I think they should be spelled. Uh, there's historical references that I have no clue about. I'm not up to my French and uh, English geography and, and historical references. So, and not to mention that the way Charles Dickens tells that story in particular, he veils a lot of the details of what's the significance of what's happening early on. So you're kind of just going about the story kind of like a blind man, you know, filling your way through. But at the end, it kind of all makes sense. So it was really difficult for me to start this book in June. And, but I, I just said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So I, I applied myself. I, I, I looked up words. I became a little bit more familiar with the details. I'd flip back and forth the page if I felt like I'd missed something. Um, and, you know, just kind of pushed through it at the beginning. And at the end of the book, I was, I was very thankful that I did that at the beginning. That very thankful that I put in the effort to learn a little bit of the landscape of that book. Uh, because A Tale of Two Cities is perhaps now my favorite novel that I've ever re- read. It's, it, it was just that good. It was, it was one of those books that I got to the last page and then like was immediately flipping back to the front page to kind of just because I was just, it was just a, a wow type ending. And it was just one of those books that I was just like, it was just great. It, was, it, was, it, it lived up to the status that it ha- had had. Um, and I would argue, I would contend that you need to read A Tale of Two Cities. I'm, I'm placing that pressure on you guys now. Um, you know, because I just thought it was just a good story that was also very insightful to a lot of the things that are going on in our current culture. Uh, but as, as important and as a great of a story A Tale of Two Cities has been for English literature, it's really nothing compared to the Gospels. It's nothing compared to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, the, the insights that Dickens, ha- uh, ha- that Dickens has in that book is, are helpful, but they're not authoritative as the insights that we see when we study the life of Christ in the four Gospels. Uh, but the four Gospels are, uh, they're scripture, they're God's word, but they're also a work of literature. They're, they're written by human authors, authors who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they told the story of Jesus Christ through these gospel narratives that include a lot of different subgenres within it and just as if I as just as I needed to kind of if I wanted to understand and enjoy Charles Dickinson's work I had to put in some effort with the gospels it's the same way there's there's a world that is that the gospels take place in that's really foreign to the world that we live in today it's it's a it was a different time there was different cultural and historical realities that were that were pressing on these things there was a lot of things at play that we're not that we're kind of in the undercurrent that we're, we we're not dealing with in the same way today. So when we want to study the Gospels and really get an understanding for what it is that they're teaching us, it's going to take that same type of effort of applying ourselves to kind of understand 
the world in which the Gospels were written and how they are fitting into a God's story. And that's what I actually want us to do tonight. Uh, before we jump in, like I said, to the, our study of the actual Gospels, I want us to prepare well for that plunge. So there's four questions I want us to answer uh, tonight. And they, these, these are the questions. One, how do the Gospels fit into God's story? Two, what were the realities that shaped Jesus' world? Three, how reliable are the Gospels? And then four, how should we read the Gospels? So the first two will help us understand the context. The third question will help us understand, okay, is these, are these trustworthy accounts? A spoiler alert, they are. And, um, and then the fourth one will help us know how we are to engage the scriptures, how we are to read them so that we can read them correctly and not read them incorrectly and make bad interpretations. So first question, let's just, let's just jump right into it. So how do the Gospels fit into God's story? So God's story, uh, his overarching kind of narrative that is being revealed in Scripture, that has been revealed in Scripture and is being revealed in creation and history, is, is simply can be broken up into four categories. You have creation, you have the fall, you have redemption, and you have restoration. So God created the heavens and the earth, and he made man in his image, and he placed them in the garden to, to exercise dominion. But they rebelled against God, and they fell into sin, and they experienced now brokenness. But as in that brokenness, God did not leave them in that brokenness, but he began to work to redeem them from that brokenness, redeem them from the bondage that their sin had put them in. And this ultimately comes to fruition in the person and work of Jesus Christ as testified in the Gospels. For Jesus is the Son of God made flesh who lived for our righteousness, died for our sins, was buried and was resurrected unto eternal life, and he is coming back to judge the living and the dead and restore all things, the final phase in God's redemptive plan where he will, this creation will pass away and there will be a new heavens and the new earth where it will be unstained, unstained by sin and brokenness and God's people will dwell forever with him in glorified bodies in that creation with perfect fulfillment, perfect satisfaction, perfect joy. That's the overarching story of what God is doing in history, and it centers on the person of Jesus Christ. But that redemption began to be announced really from the fall itself. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the first kind of instances of this gospel redemption, that, a pronouncement that was going to take place through the seed of the woman who would crush the, the seed of the serpent, who would crush the enemy. And this redemption then begins to be progressively announced through covenants. In the Old Testament, there are four major covenants uh, that are, are really important for us to know. And that's the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, or the Old Covenant, the Davidic covenant, and Jeremiah and others prophesied of a new covenant. So Abrahamic was one to Abraham, the Mosaic was one to Moses, Davidic was one to David, and then the New Covenant, which is prophesied in, in the prophecies. So the Abrahamic Covenant announced a son of promise through whom all the families of the earth would be, would, would be blessed. The Mosaic Covenant organized God's delivered people. So Moses delivers the people from slavery in the Exodus, and he organizes them as a nation with God as their ultimate king. So ultimately, that's what's happening in the Old Covenant. God is organizing his people as his nation where he's going to be their king, and it sets up a sacrificial system and gives instructions for how the Israelites would live as the people of God. A couple things about the Old Testament or the Old Covenant is it outlined blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience, namely the exile. We just read, if you've been in some of our life group lesson materials in 2 Kings, we've been talking about the exile at length. Uh, so that was the curse of the Old Covenant for disobedience. And the Old Covenant was always intended to be temporary. And another thing about the Old Covenant that's important for us to understand is that it was never about earning salvation through works. It still was about engaging God who saves by His grace and mercy, uh, engaging Him by grace through faith and then living out their relationship with God in works of righteousness. Uh, and the structure for that was the Old Covenant. And like I said, this was always meant to be temporary. Everything in the Old Covenant was foreshadowing something uh, that would come about at a later time. And then the Third Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, promised a son in the lineage of David who would reign and, would, and his throne would be established in righteousness and would never end. 
So God made a promise to David that his son would, would, his line would stay on the throne forever. And that wasn't fulfilled in Solomon because Solomon died. And after him, the kingdom was divided. There was a greater son that was to come. And then Jeremiah, after the exile, prophesied of a new covenant that would replace the old covenant and would be brought about through the Christ, that is, the Messiah. It spoke of forgiveness. It spoke of the regathering of the people of God. It spoke of restoration, and it spoke of peace. So this is the hope of the faithful Israelites in exile. Now, I just did a lot of overview, so I just want to give you a second to breathe. That was, those are the four major covenants of the Old Testament. There's, there's, there's probably a covenant with Adam in the garden, potentially. There's definitely one with Noah. Uh, but these four, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and the New Covenant, are really the big four that are moving uh, God's redemptive narrative forward. And they're all foreshadowing something that is to come. They're all not being realized um, by the immediate players. Isaac wasn't the fulfillment of the uh, Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, Israel uh, was not the fulfillment of God's ultimate people in the Old Testament. That's, that's being fulfilled now uh, and, and in the future. The Davidic Covenant was not fulfilled in, um, in um, Solomon, and the New Covenant was not fulfilled in the, uh, those who returned uh, from exile after the 70 years. So when we get to the Gospels now, and Matthew opens his Gospel with this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ is not a last name, but a title. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew is making one of the most loaded statements that he can make for those familiar with the Old Testament. He is basically saying, in short, he's saying Jesus of Nazareth is the one the entire Bible has been about. Everything that has been written in the scriptures has been pointed to this person. Jesus the Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. He is the son of promise through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. He is the son of David whose throne and kingdom will never end. Everything that precedes the gospels and everything that follows can be only be understood if we understand these four counts and particularly how they testify of this person, Jesus of Nazareth. So when we're studying the Gospels, it's important to remember, now we're not going to be able to get into the fullness of the Old Testament and how it foreshadows Christ and it foreshadows what God is doing in the Gospels. But the best resource for understanding what the Gospels are teaching us is to understand the Old Testament. The best commentary on the New Testament, and particularly the Gospels, is the Old Testament. How God has been placing things in, uh, revealing things progressively through these, uh, these different narratives, these psalms, and these prophecies. All of these are, are pointing towards something in the future. They're not meant to be the end of themselves, but they're meant to point us to something in the future, namely Jesus Christ as he's revealed in the four Gospels. So the Gospels detail God's fulfillment of the Old Covenant in Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and, and, how, and it testifies of how he inaugurates the New Covenant, which establishes his kingdom. Remember he says at the beginning of Mark, the kingdom of God is at hand, and it includes people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and it will have no end. We are now, through faith, a part of God's kingdom spiritually, and we will enjoy citizenship in his kingdom physically for all of eternity in the resurrection. So that is the hope that is announced in the Gospels. And I like how J.T. Pennington sums it up in this. He says, the message of the Gospels can be defined as Jesus affecting the long-awaited arrival of God himself as king in the power of the Spirit, bringing his people back from exile and into the true promised land of a new creation forgiving their sins, and fulfilling all the promises of God and the hopes of the people. So when we talk about God's story, the Gospels stand at the center of it. They help us understand everything uh, that's in the Scriptures. If we misunderstand the Gospels, you're going to misread the Old Testament, and you're going to misread everything that comes out uh, after in the, in the New Testament. So understanding uh, what God is teaching us in these four Gospels is crucial for understanding overall what God is doing in history. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next question. So that's how God's, uh, the Gospels fit into God's story as revealed in Scriptures. 
what are the realities that are now shaping uh, Jesus' world when he is born? Uh, and I think there's five realities, five historical and religious realities that really help us understand what's going on in the world when Jesus comes on to the scene. Uh, and the first, which I've already mentioned briefly, is the exile. So the exile, which I said is the curses for disobedience in the Old Covenant, was effectively this corporate fall of Israel. It was, this death, it was the death of the nation, so to speak. Instead of living in the promised land with, as God's people, with God as their king, they were scattered throughout foreign land. But they weren't scattered without hope. Because remember, the new, the new covenant was being prophesied through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel, through others as well that testified of this regathering of the people of God, a return to the promised land where God's people were enjoy his restoration. And namely, they were talking about what would come in the future in the new creation and the new heavens and the new earth and also in the millennial kingdom of Christ. So that is, was a reality that was just very felt by the Israelites in the first century. It happened about six, seven centuries before, but it was still on the minds of the people. In fact, the northern kingdom still had not actually officially returned like the southern kingdom has, and there was still a lot of shame and baggage that was being uh, felt from that. Uh, and there was still hope for restoration for those who were faithful, who were still studying the scriptures, who were looking for, um, uh, for the Messiah in the right way. So the exile really helped kind of shape the longings of the people of God uh, at that time. And they really, understanding the exile and how the new covenant undoes a lot of the, the curses of the exile and brings about peace and restoration and healing for the land, it really helps us understand the significance of a lot of the miracles and messages of, and the message of Jesus Christ. So the exile is very important. Uh, it's a... Uh, a source of shame for the Israelites, uh, a, a reminder of the fact that they uh, disobeyed God's law and the curses of the old covenant were laid upon them. But there's also this hope of this new covenant that is to be, become. Now, as I mentioned, the northern kingdom were still scattered about. They didn't. They, there was no big return of the new, northern kingdom, but there was one of the southern kingdom. This was partial, uh, a, a partial fulfillment of God's promises uh, when the exiles returned from Babylon, but this was nowhere near the glory that the new covenant uh, talked about. So when you're talking about when Ezra and Nehemiah, they're, bringing, they're coming back with the people, they're rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, and they're settling back in the promised land. Uh, but they're not settling back in the prob- promised land um, as independent Israel. They're settling back in the promised land under the rule of foreign occupiers. So this is the second reality that shapes the world of, of Jesus, and that is the foreign occupation of Jerusalem. So just a brief overview of that, uh, of how that works, is you had the Babylonians that came in, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he exiles Judah uh, and moves a lot of those people um, into Babylon. And then after after Babylon comes the Persians, the Persians, Darius, um, and others, and they begin to allow people to resettle back in the promised land, but they're still under the control of the Persian government. And then after the Persians is the Greeks, Alexander the, Alexander the Great. He comes in and begins to conquer. He takes over uh, that region and begins to infuse Greek culture into the way of life. So the way that the, um, the Greeks really sought to uh, bring about their conquering is they would they would take over places but then they would really work to infuse their culture teach people their language and assimilate people into kind of this Hellenized uh, Greek culture and so that's very important for just the translation of the scriptures in Greek in the future but that's that's what happened in that time period and there was a couple places where um, there, that rule centered after Alexander the Great. There was a, a center in Egyptian that continued, I mean, in Egypt that continued for some time, and then after Egypt in Syria. Now, after the Syrians um, began to control, there was this rebellion that we're going to talk about in just a moment that led to this brief period of um, autonomy. It was a crippled autonomy, but it was autonomy nonetheless, and um, and that lasted for about 80 years, and then it we finally come to. Uh, the Romans. Uh, the Romans come in, they take over, 
and this continues throughout um, the life of pretty much the New Testament. Uh, Rome doesn't fall for many years after that. But effectively, in 70 AD, with the destruction of the temple, uh, the national identity of the Israelites has been pretty much decimated. Uh, so that's kind of a reality. They were in the promised land, but they did not have rule over themselves for the majority of that time from the exile, and definitely not at the life of Jesus. The Romans were occupying what they sought to be and what actually was their land. They were not uh, sovereign over their own uh, promised land. And the, the self-rule period, though, that is, as I mentioned before, was brought about by these guys called the Maccabees. Uh, you may have heard it. There's a, like an Apocrypha type book in the Old Testament that some like Catholic Bibles have in it. And it just tells the story of this and probably some other things as well. But there is, um, I just want, this is a very important thing for us understanding uh, some of the expectations of the people of God at the time of Jesus. So there was this emperor named Antiochus who comes in, he desecrates the temple. He walks into the temple, declares himself to be God, I think slaughters a pig on the altar and, and just kind of removes, you know, removes the sacrificial system from the temple that had been rebuilt. And um, these guys named Judas and his brother Jonathan, uh, they kind of flee to the, the wilderness and they begin to lead this revolt against the Syrians. They kind of operate this kind of guerrilla warfare um, campaign, and they're called, um, nicknamed Maccabeus, which means the hammer. That's what their nickname was, is, is the hammer. So Judas the hammer was what he was, what he was called. And on December 25th, 164 BC, they recapture Jerusalem and they drive away these foreign occupiers. And this begins this, the celebration of Hanukkah, uh, the festival of lights. Uh, that's where that celebration comes from. It comes from this revolt that was led by Judas uh, Maccabeus, uh, the hammer, and he leads this revolt. He captures Jerusalem, drives out these idolaters out of the temple, reinstitutes the temple sacrifice, sacrificial system, and regains sovereignty over the land uh, in about 164 BC. So, and that enters into a period of about 80 years of where they were had this kind of self rule uh, at that time. It was weak, but it was self rule nonetheless. But understanding the Maccabees helps us kind of understand why everyone seems to miss it when Jesus comes on the scene. Uh, Maccabeus, uh, as I said, was not a last name, but a nickname meaning the hammer. And Judas thus forms this political and militant figure who shaped for many the expectations of what the Messiah would be like when he came. He, for him, for the Jewish people at that day, for most of them, the Messiah was like Judas Maccabeus. And they... Be, the people began to look for the hammer, and they looked for the hammer so much that they missed the man of sorrows who was going to come and suffer and die in the place of sinners so that they might have salvation. So because they had this idea of what the Messiah would look like, they missed the Messiah when he actually did come. So uh, the, the Maccabeans uh, is, is important for understanding that, how that kind of comes about. And then you have the Herodian dynasty, the Herods. The Herods are, are kind of like these, no one really likes the Herods. Uh, this, the period of self-rule uh, self comes to an end when the Romans uh, take over. And Herod, uh, the, Herod the Great, I believe, had, been in it, had fled to Rome because he was afraid of something that was happening with the people. And Rome actually sets up Herod as the leader and ruler of Judea. So not only have they just lost their autonomy, now we got this guy named Herod who is leading the people who was not set up by the people of God, but were set up by the Romans. And he uh, begins to um, live and rule uh, during that time period. Uh, he's called Herod the Great uh, because of his political success. He was an excellent builder. He uh, renovated the temple uh, and, and really made it into one of the ancient wonders of the world. Uh, he had uh, a lot of just political success, a long reign, but he was very paranoid and very wicked. He like, killed a lot of people, like a lot of people who he thought was going to take his throne. He killed a lot of family members, uh, and he was the one that, if you remember in Matthew, he was the one that tried to kill Jesus when he was born. So that's Herod the Great. And then he has three sons after he dies that take over. 
Uh, the first one is Archelaus, and really, the only thing you need to know about Archelaus is that he was incredibly incompetent. He was a horrible leader, and he lost his position after two years. He ruled over Judea, Samaria, and this small region called Edomea. And they, the Rome just, they just took him out, and they replaced him with governors, one of which later on was Pontius Pilate. And then you had Philip. He was kind of just a, a basic leader, you know, didn't do too much, uh, good or bad. He just was conscientious. And he had a small section over in, up in the northeast. He, they visit, um, the disciples visited a, a couple times in the Gospels. And then you have Anipas. He's the most capable politically, but he's also wicked. He's the one that John the Baptist speaks against, who is imprisoned by, he's beheaded. He's the one that Jesus appears before at his crucifixion and is mocked by. Uh, so those are, the, these, these Herods, those are the Herods that are ruling at the time of Christ. Uh, and these wicked rulers really only heightened uh, the misguided expectation for the Messiah who would come in and not only set the people free from these, this foreign occupation, but also set the people free from the wicked rulers uh, that were over them of their own people. So those are, the, those are the historical realities. And then the fifth reality that shaped Jesus' world is the state of first century uh, Judaism. So when we think of what the religion of the people of God is like in, in, first, in that first century. There was a small minority of people who were faithful, uh, who were pursuing the Lord as God intended to, and these ultimately became disciples of Jesus Christ in the Gospels and the book of Acts. But the rest have r really departed from the Old Testament. So what we see in like the Pharisees and the Sadducees isn't really what the Old Testament taught, but it's their corruption of what the Old Testament taught. So they were fiercely monotheistic, which is, which is good, but they were so much so that they missed the fact that God was triune, that he was Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So when the Son of God was standing in front of them, they, they, they could not wrap their minds around what he was revealing to them when he said, would say things like, I, am the fa I and the Father are one. So they were fiercely monotheistic. They were, they were guided more by... Um, the oral traditions of the rabbis than by the scriptures. This is what Jesus is constantly fighting against. He says, you're elevating the traditions of men over the word of God. Uh, Herod's temple, the renovation, had really become a source of idolatry and was no longer functioning according to the holiness that God had intended for it. Uh, Kost uh, Andreas Kostenberger, uh, which is one of the resources I'm using, I'm using a few resources, Mark Strauss, the ESV Study Bible, uh, Andreas Kostenberger, uh, J.T. Pennington, a lot of other people are, are kind of informing some of the stuff I'm sharing with you uh, on the historical side is, especially. But he says, in Jesus' day, the temple, once the glorious symbol of God's presence with his people, had degenerated into a place of commerce and mindless ritual. So you have fiercely monotheistic, guided more by their traditions than the scriptures, the temple has become a place of idolatry and uh, wickedness. And then you have these four Jewish sects, uh, these groups. You have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and the Essenes. Uh, not much is known about the Essenes. They were these hermits. Uh, we think they're the ones that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the Zealots were these kind of militant terrorist kind of people. They opposed any and all foreign uh, uh, influences. And um, they would be violent uh, and, and lead rebellions. And then you had the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the big, the big two that we see in the Gospels. Uh, the Sadducees were kind of like this ruling aristocrats, um, aristocracy. I don't know how to say that word, but you know the word I'm trying to say. Uh, they were the ruling class. Uh, they desired to keep kind of the status quo. They were a little bit more liberal in their understanding of the scriptures. They pretty much just stuck to the, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, and then you have the, the Pharisees. They were a little bit more conservative in the scriptures. They recognized all of the, uh, the scriptures to be God's word, but they were self-righteous. Um, and they, they relied more on the oral traditions uh, and the prescriptions that they gave rather than what the scriptures taught. Uh, and I think G.K. Uh, Bill, Bill sums up this, this time period well. And then, as I mentioned before, before I get to that quote, uh, there was this heightened messianic ex expectation uh, at that time, who would come and deliver them from the Romans. But it, Greg Bill refers to this time, I think, very 
correctly when he says this. He says, Israel in Jesus' time was indeed guilty of idol worship, a different form of idol worship than in previous generations. Israel of Jesus' day was idolatrous because it had worshiped tradition in the place of God and his living word. So those are the five historical realities that are really shaping the, the world that Jesus inhabited. Um, there is this, this the, the residue of the exile, the present reality of foreign occupation, uh, the, the Maccabees paving the way for what they thought the Messiah would be like, the Herods and their wicked rule, and then this, the really just idolatrous state of first century uh, Judaism that had lost all of its power because it had divorced itself from the scriptures and uh, the truth of God. So that's really the context that we really need to have to kind of understand and begin to study the scriptures, recognizing that the gospels stand at the center of God's revelation, how the entire Old Testament had been moving to this point and understanding just how jacked up the world was at that time when Jesus was born. So then we have to ask the question now is how reliable are these four books? How reliable, I mean, I'm up here saying that these are the most important documents ever written in human history and ever will be. So we need to ask the question, are they reliable? Uh, and as far as ancient historical writings go, the Gospels are significantly more reliable than any other ancient document. They are, as far as ancient historical writings go, you're not going to get better reliability than the four Gospels. You're just not. Um, and other than that, we know by faith that they are the Word of God, they are the Scriptures, inspired by the Holy Spirit, thus without error in everything that they attest. So, but as far as, the, as just the reliability goes on a more uh, base kind of level, we see three things that really help us be confident in um, our faith at the fact that they are the Word of God. Uh, so these things support that uh, with good, good evidence. One, they are eyewitness accounts presented to other eyewitnesses. So eyewitness accounts are still one of the most powerful forms of evidence. If, if I see something happen, if I see Clark just deck a guy at, at, the, <laughs> at the cafe, I, I see it happen with my own eyes. I can, that's, that's valuable, admissible evidence in court. And if there's other eyewitnesses that are there, they can go, yeah, I saw it too. That's, that's what happened. The details of the event might be a little bit different, but the fact that I was an eyewitness presenting an account with other white eyewitnesses to kind of fact check me would make that a little bit more uh, reliable. And the Gospels are those type of accounts. They were written by eyewitnesses or closely related to white eyewitnesses. So Mark has, has close ties with Peter. Uh, Luke has close ties with um, Paul, uh, Mary, and other uh, other disciples as well, and other accounts. So they are based on eyewitness accounts, and they are attested in a, just an overwhelming number of manuscripts that are consistent in what they, uh, they, what they attest to. There's, there's variations, like little minor errors among the Gospels uh, manuscripts, like a letter is missed out here, or it's added in here, or a line has been skipped over. Those kind of things are in the manuscripts. But there's no major, like, this gospel says, this manuscript says Jesus did not raise from the dead. This gospel says there. There's none of those kind of errors where there's contradictory on any major truth claims. Um, the biggest variations in the gospel witnesses uh, would be there's, there's questions about the ending of Mark and particularly John 8 in the episode where the woman is uh, saved from being stoned. Uh, those are the only two accounts uh, that are questionable as if they were original to the, um, the original manuscripts, but even those two do not attest to any, uh, do not, no major doctrine of our faith rests on those two passages alone. So um, they were written during the lifetime of those who would have personally remembered the events. So if they were just making outlandish claims, they would have been rejected as, oh, that's ridiculous. That didn't happen. I was there, you know. Jesus didn't raise from the dead. He wasn't even crucified. You know, if they weren't accurate in what they were attesting to, then they would not have been received and passed along. And then second thing is, is the Gospels possess a unified, but not a uniform, retelling of events. So they, all four Gospels basically track on the same pattern of, of the way the ministry of God comes about. They tell things in different orders because there's just different standards there. Uh, and they're unified in what they attest to. 
uh, with one voice, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, both all four proclaim that Jesus was portrayed by Judas, that he was rejected by the Jews, and he was crucified by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate on a Friday and rose from the dead on Sunday. All of them present Jesus as the Son of God made flesh. He worked miracles and he taught with authority about the kingdom of God. The Gospels are very unified in that presentation. I mean, those are all major things. I mean, we're so familiar with those things. Each one of those things is significant. And the Gospels are very unified in their presentation with that. In fact, many miracles being told by um, different authors in the same um, you know, with the same kind of end in mind. With one miracle in particular, the feeding of 5,000, that is told by all, all four. Um, so they're unified in what they attest to, but they're also not uniform. So if, let's say Clark was arresting me and, and a few other of my buddies, we had done something um, illegal and we were trying to get out of it. So he arrests us, he puts us in different interrogating rooms, and he's, he's saying, hey, you tell me what's going on. And I, we've rehearsed our story. So I tell my story, it's, it's to a T. You know, I, I got it right. My buddies, they're prepared too. I mean, we're, we're a well-prepared group of criminals, I guess. But we got caught. So uh, my buddy, he tells his story to a T. I mean, he, he nailed it. And my third buddy, he does the exact same thing. Exact. I mean, we nailed it. Everything that we rehearsed, we told exactly exactly how we thought we should but Clark if he's a good cop and I think he is a good cop uh, he would recognize hey something ain't right here because I'm telling the story in the exact same way with the exact same words with the exact same minor details as, as, as all three in fact if he was a good police officer he would go this isn't the real story they've rehearsed this and they've now told this now, the Gospels, though, are not like that. There's dissimilarities among the witness. Uh, they vary in details. They vary in the ordering of the, of the events. They tell about the same event, but they focus in on different things. In, in fact, some of them focus in on different details. You're like, how did they miss that? But the dissimilarities really add to the strength of the witnesses. They do not weaken them. So when we run across some of these dissimilarities, there's four reasons that kind of could help us understand why they are dissimilar. Well, one, like as I, the main reason is honest testimonies are not uniform when they're told from different people because different people interpret the same event in different ways. Uh, these are still, they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, but not apart from the human personality of the author. So there's, that plays a role in it. But these four reasons uh, can help us understand why there are dissimilarities among the gospel witnesses. One, there are different perspectives of the same event. So when you look at Matthew 8 and Luke 7, which both tell the same story, uh, of the centurion coming to Jesus to have a servant healed, Matthew just talks about how the centurion is coming to uh, Jesus, where Luke focuses on the fact that the centurion sent servants to Jesus. Effectively, whether it was through a servant or through his own voice, the centurion was the one making the request of Jesus. Matthew and Luke chose those details for different reasons. And with intentionality, as we'll see when we look at Matthew 8, if I finish in time, which is not looking like I'm going to. Um, and then also, we know that Jesus didn't just say the same thing in one place, like one time. He had a kind of a rotational ministry. He said, you know, he, taught, he may have taught um, the same thing in different ways at different times. So Luke might have recorded, you know, what he was saying in Capernaum. Uh, whereas Matthew recorded a similar teaching that he was saying in a, a different region or a different time in Capernaum. It, they might have re recorded a different um, aspect of his itinerant ministry. And then there's this idea that, uh, of, of what the Gospels are actually communicating. And I'm going to use, I think this is Latin. I'm, I'm fairly certain it's Latin. And you have this idea of epistema verba, which is the exact words, and you have this idea of epistema vox, the exact voice. So when we read the Gospels, what, we under, what we're listening to there is the epistema vox, the exact voice of Christ, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, not the epistema verba, the exact words of Christ, or anyone else for that matter. For Christ spoke in Aramaic, and these were translated in Greek, and we have now had them translated uh, to us in English. A good example of this variation is in the baptismal narrative. One gospel account says, this is my beloved son. Another 
gospel account says, you are my beloved son. It's not like God said to the crowd, hey, this is my beloved son. And then he turned and said to Jesus, hey, you are my beloved son. They're communicating the same event, but they're using pretty, they're communicating the exact voice of what was occurring there, but not exactly the exact words. It's still accurate. It's still inerrant. It's true. Um, but it is the exact voice of what is being communicated in that uh, moment. And then lastly, there are just simple, simply different expectations of ancient biographies regarding chronology and quotation than there are of modern biographies. So when we expect, when we're reading a biography today, we expect it to look a different way. We expect it to be chronological. We expect it to be when there's quotes. We don't expect paraphrases, but we expect exact words. That's was just not the expectation uh, of ancient biographies in that time period. It doesn't mean that they were less accurate. It's just they had more freedom to retell what happened, what actually happened in different ways. Some might have been more thematic. Um, Mar uh, Matthew organizes his Gospels around five teachings of Christ. Uh, Luke is, is a little bit more organized. Uh, John organizes his differently as well. You know, so they, they had freedom to retell what actually happened in unique ways, but it doesn't take away from the accuracy of those claims. So those are the four reasons for this, the similarities. Um, that if you were worried about some of that, that should hopefully quell some of those worries. And then lastly, why are the Gospels reliable? If Jesus' disciples made up the Gospel accounts, uh, they were bad at it. Um, there's a lot of details that would have uh, boosted their strength if they would have done things differently. One, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not the people that you would pick to write them. They were more obscure. Not much is known about them uh, other than the fact that they wrote the Gospels. Uh, when you talk about these Gnostic and false Gospels that came up during that time, like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Peter, they used more well-known characters like Peter and like Thomas, who were popular, uh, to boost their credibility. They would attribute these to these people. And also, that's just another thing. You might hear up in the 50s, you know, like, or like some archaeologists find, oh, there's this long-lost Gospel that like, is going to radically change the way that we view Jesus Christ. Like the ancient church knew about all of those, and they said they're all <laughs> false. The only four go the four gospels that we have in the scriptures are the true gospels. Anything else that comes up is just false and has been recognized as false by the ancient church. And then second, each account testifies women being the ones who discovered the empty tomb, which would not have been the choice of someone making the gospels up since their testimony was not admissible in courts at that time. Um, and, and included details. The gospels included details like. Just the head-splitting ignorance of the disciples, they just couldn't get it. Uh, they, did, they ran away from Jesus when he was being crucified. Uh, Peter denied Christ three times. Um, all of these details that the disciples were making it up, uh, they would not have included. Uh, so all of that kind of boosts uh, their credibility. All right. Let's take a deep breath. We've answered three questions. Let's answer the fourth. So how should we read the Gospels? Well, we want to have a good hermeneutic, and that is a hermeneutic is the art and science of reading the Bible well. It's the, it's the way we interpret text when we read it. We want to understand what we're reading and come to the right meaning of what is being communicated to us. So what's important to that? Context, context, context. I like this coffee mug. It says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Um, and the context that we're looking at, looking at is we're looking at the immediate context. What's happening in the passages before? What's happening in the narrative right around this section? We're looking at the context of the whole book. Uh, how does this passage fit in the book of, of uh Itself, How does it fit in the scriptures? As I've already told you, that the gospel stand at the center of the entire uh, scriptures. And, you know, how, what's the historical context as well? Uh, the best reading is the one that the author intended. So if the author intended a single meaning, then a single meaning is the best in, uh, reading. If he intended a kind of a double fulfillment, then a double fulfillment is the best way to read it. If he intended it to be understood literally, then that's the best way to understand it. If he intended it to be understood figuratively, like, hey, take your eye out and throw it away if it's causing you to sin, then we should understand it figuratively. We shouldn't be all walking around with one eye because we're all taking our eye out or chopping our hand off. Like, that's the author intended some, a way it to be understood, and the best reading is the one that the author intended, the divine author or the human author. So sometimes the human author, we see this especially in the Old Testament, is writing with an immediate context in mind while God is intending this to foreshadow something uh, that is to come ultimately to be fulfilled in Christ. And then we want to observe, we want to explain, 
and then we want to apply. So we want to look at the text, read it, see what's happening in the text, we want to explain it, and then we want to apply it to our lives. I'm just going to do a quick exercise, and I'm, we only got like two minutes for this. How many squares do you see on your handout? In, in that little diagram. You, you've done this before. I've only heard one person give the correct answer, and he's heard me do this illustration before. There's 30 squares. There's 16 one by ones. There's nine two by twos. There's four three by threes, and there's one four by four. This illustration is just a simple illustra illustration to say, and you, you may have been looking at that thing this whole time, because it's like the only pictures on this, on this notes. Uh, when you've looked at something, you haven't looked at it enough. It's like communication. When you think you've communicated something, you haven't communicated it enough. When you're observing the scripture, and you think you've observed it enough, you probably haven't. So observation is very important. So that's just a, a fun little exercise when we're reading. Now, when it comes to Gospels in particular, I've already highlighted that there's four accounts, and sometimes there's different accounts, uh, like Matthew may refer to an event, Luke may refer to that same event, and Mark might as well. So how do we, want to, how do we read these? And I'm going, to, I'm, going to position, I'm going to talk to you about three ways that you can read the Bible, uh, or read the Gospels. Is one, it's called a vertical reading. I'm borrowing this terminology from uh, Mark Strauss. A vertical reading is you read the gospel pretty much only looking at Matthew. I'm only going to look at Matthew when Matthew's talking about this. I'm not going to concern myself uh, with anything else. A harmonious reading is when you look at Matthew's account, you look at Luke's account, and you combine them together to come up with a single uh, retelling of that narrative. Uh, and then you have a horizontal reading account is when you're reading one and you're comparing it to the same account in the other. My contention is, and what I believe to be best is, is that we want to read the, the Gospels vertically, focusing in on the one narrative while reading it horizontally, not to come to, to, an, to a harmony, but to better understand why Matthew is including the details that Matthew is including or why Mark is including the details that Mark is including. Because when we try to har harmonize the Gospels, the Gospels weren't given to us as one story. They were given to us as four accounts of the same uh, life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So when we, when we harmonize the Gospels into one account, we actually miss the context of the original author. And we, and we combine it together and we smooth over details that are important that are meant to communicate. Because Matthew includes details for a specific reason. So if Luke includes different details than Matthew does, or Matthew includes more details than Luke does, Math Matthew is including those details for a specific purpose. So when we like a good, you know, when we read um, of the centurion, Matthew has details that Luke does not have, and there's specific reasons why he has those. Um, when we blend these things together, we lose sight of both Matthew's intended reading and. Luke's intended reading. And remember, the goal is to understand what the author is intending. So when we come to a harmony, while it may be fun and helpful for like, you know, Easter plays or, you know, Bible TV shows or whatever, but we actually lose sight of what the author is intending when we do that when we're reading. So we want to read vertically and read horizontally so that we can read better vertically, if that makes sense. And then we want to read the Gospels as stories if there's a narrative. There's a lot of genres in the Gospels. There's teaching, there's narrative, there's parables, there's apocalyptic, there's wisdom, there's poetry. So we want to make sure we're respecting the genre, but a lot of it is story. So here's just some 10 steps from, from Jonathan Pennington's uh, book that will help us understand it, how to read this, uh, how to read these gospel stories. One, we want to isolate the story. We want to make sure that we have the whole story in view. Uh, we don't want to just highlight some aspect in the beginning of the story uh, and miss sight of what God is actually teaching us because we might be highlighting something that is actually condemned later on in the story. We want to read it multiple times. We want to identify things like the setting and the characters. We want to observe the story. We want to isolate the different scenes. So what, you know, think about the different scenes in the narrative. And then we want to analyze the narrative. You know, what's the tension? Stories move forward based on conflict. So when, what, what's, 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 what's the tension in this? Is it someone's paralyzed? Is it the Pharisees are misunderstanding the law of God and they're hard-hearted? 
What, what tension is driving the narrative forward? And then what is the climactic event? Like what's, what's, where does this ten- tension reach a crescendo where this story is going to be resolved? And then what's the resolution? What's the outcome? And then what is the following action or the interpretation of what has just taken place? And then we want to place that story in context. And then we want to summarize the narrative, retell it in our own words. And we want to articulate how God is revealed in the person of Christ. And then we want to apply it to our own life. What needs to be uh, replicated? What needs to be avoided? So we got 10 minutes. I was hoping to have five more minutes for this part, but we just got, we just got 10. I want us to look at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to go ahead and isolate the story for you. And it's going to be at Matthew 8, 5 through 13. And I want you to read it twice. You would read it more, probably, if you were studying it in depth. Read it twice. And then I want you to go over, and I want you to read that story twice, and I want you to work through as a table and identify the setting and the characters and isolate the different scenes and work through questions three, four, five, and 6 together. And then, after you do that, let's, let's just talk through it, okay? We got, you got about seven minutes for this. And it may be that we don't actually talk about it as a, as a big group, but I want you to do it uh, together as a table. So Matthew 8, read it twice, and then talk through 3, 4, 5, and 6. 13. 